Howdy students, Humanities 4, Film Studies, Shasta College. How y'all doing? How was your weekend? It was spring-like. But we're not in spring yet. A little too soon for spring. And now it's getting windy and chilly again, so. Day. Uh, have patience on grading, me grading your your first essay, almost done. Pay attention to the comments. Look at the instructions. Watch my lectures to understand what I'm looking for. And I just hope you all get that little book, Writing About Movies. It will help you a lot. Next time I talk to you guys, which would be in a day or two, I will uh, keep going over some more of that, but not tonight. Um, just wanted to catch up. See what's going on in your world. Hope you're watching these movies. Hope you're getting something out of it. Like knowledge, being educated about something you don't know. Maybe being surprised how old movies can affect you. Hopefully that's a huge part of it. This paper, I think, is due on Thursday, so you still got a couple of days. I'm not going to bug you about it. I'll be assigning another essay at the end of this week. It's it's going to be the movie Citizen Kane, so get ready to watch that. Anyway, uh, by Orson Welles. So um, now World War II is ended. How did it end? Well, we dropped an atomic bomb in Japan. Germany ended... A little before that, uh, didn't end good. We firebombed and England firebombed. We bombed every major city in Germany, flattened them. And Hitler finally did the right thing and killed himself. They kept fighting, though. The war continued after he was already dead. It was just a matter of time. Somewhere around June 45, they gave it up for good. And the world was devastated. Rome, Berlin were, had been bombed, been devastated. So many of our great Amer uh, European cities were devastated through bombing. We didn't get bombed, though, because we had two oceans protecting us. They couldn't get to us. So the war is over. What is going to change in Hollywood? Well, they still want our dollars. The filmmakers who came back, I'm going to show you guys this film clip. I'll post it in modules. It's, called, it's a documentary called Five Who Came Back. It's about five Hollywood directors. John Ford, who directed Stagecoach. Um, William Wyler, who directed Best Years of Our Lives. And Mrs. Minervere. John Houston, who directed and wrote Um, to have and to have not. With Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> I'm forgetting all the directors. Frank Capra, who directed It Happened One Night, which is one of the optional films you could write about this last week. Uh, he came... And they all... George Stevens, who mostly was known for directing kind of lightweight comedies and musicals, some of them with uh, uh, the little child actress um, who was really, really famous in the 30s. I mean, she was so famous, she was the number one box office draw. <laughs> I never cared for those films, and now I can't even think what her name is. Uh, this is horrible. I should write it down one time. She was as big as you could get. 
and because uh, she was so cute and adorable. When she grew up, she wasn't so cute and adorable, and her acting career dried up, and she became a politician, an ambassador. Uh, I think in uh, either Nixon's, she was a Republican, Nixon's White House, or Ronald Reagan's White House, I can't remember. Why can't I think of her name? Hmm. Shirley Temple. There you go. <laughs> Little Moppet. Anyway, um, when these guys came, they all went to the war. They put their careers on hold. That was the bold thing they did. They put their careers on hold, and they are all. Some of these people had won the Academy Award. They were huge, hugely uh, influential, popular, and they're making a good living, living the good life in Beverly Hills or out in Malibu. The war happened, and they felt that they wanted to help the war effort. Most of them were way too old to go actually fight in the trenches. Most of them were in their 50s, 60s. John Ford was in his 60s. Uh, John Houston was probably the youngest, but he was still too old in his late 30s, wherever it was. And so they wanted to give something back. They joined the military, and they started a group, a division, a film division, that was going to film documentary films on the war effort. And Frank Capra was the head of it. John Ford was, they made him a colonel. And they wanted them to cover the war. Every mat film material you've seen in World War II and whatever movie you've ever seen is their footage that they shot. Yes, when they did the D-Day landings, a bunch of the cameramen were killed, folks. If you've seen Private Ryan, you know what I'm talking about. The Germans shot everything. They didn't spare cameramen. Um, John Ford was assigned the Pacific. He was there, the Battle of Midway, directing documentaries on the war effort. They gave up really lucrative careers to get minimum wage in the army. Now, these guys are all too old to go to boot camp, boot camp and all that, but they did walk away. And they left their families back in Beverly Hills to suffer <laughs> with whatever they were living on then, their savings. How many directors, actors, celebrities would has went to Afghanistan to fight or to film? Or to Iraq. Zero. Nobody went off to give their careers up. Uh, that's the difference. This is this World War II was considered the good war. We we're fighting evil forces in the Pacific with Japan, an imperialistic nation. And we're fighting Nazism in Europe. These are villains of the highest order. And so these gentlemen went off to war. Some of them for four or five years. They made some documentaries. Most of the footage you've seen and whatever documentaries you've ever seen were, were taken by these gentlemen. But when they submitted their films, a lot of them were put in the vault because they were considered too graphic. The Pentagon was upset that they actually sh showed American casualties. This was a no-no. So the documentaries they put out had been heavily edited for propaganda purposes. It looked like no Americans were dying, that we were only uh, doing all the damage. That's not true, folks. And so we could get more money to finance the war. These filmmakers went off with, like a lot of Americans, like a lot of people in the world, with idealistic viewpoint that America was doing the right thing. They saw sh stuff in the war that they never forgot. This is before we had post-traumatic stress syndrome, but they all came back altered forever. 
War will do that to you, folks. Maybe some of you have been in a warfare situation or a traumatic situation. It could be an accident. It could be a shooting. It could be whatever we have here in the United States, which is plenty of. And it's hard to sleep. It's hard to eat. It's hard to fall, concentrate on your kids when you have this traumatic mindset that you've seen some stuff that was so disturbing that you can't get over it. My father was, just to give you a personal story, my father was in World War II. He was a pilot. And a lot of guys, his generation, this is before we had a lot of psychiatrists and people taking Prozac to, for everything they were taking. Um, and he was a lifelong alcoholic. That's what the, how they dealt with it. We didn't know it was caused by. We just thought that generation of men my dad's generation, which would, went off to World War II, many, many of them returned and were lifelong alcoholics. And like my dad, functioning alcoholic. He went to work every day, paid his bills, and was drinking every night <laughs> most of my life. Uh, we thought that was normal. That's how he dealt with the horrors of war. Well, when these directors came back, they wanted to resume their careers, and Hollywood couldn't wait for them to resume their careers. But they put their foot down and said, we can't make films that aren't truthful. John Ford was still in the military in 1945, even though the war was winding down. Uh, and they wanted him to make a war film. And he said, only if I could do it and make it what really happened, not a propaganda film. Meaning it doesn't look like America is the good guy necessarily. It doesn't look like America is winning the war necessarily. It's making it more real because he'd seen the real thing. He was in the Battle of Midway which was a major turnaround, uh, ocean warfare. He was actually wounded to get the Purple Heart in it. <coughs> From Japanese kamikaze pilots who would fly into the boat, the ship, battleship he was on. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so he came back and he said, yeah, I'll direct this movie, but I got to do it my way. You can't tie my hands down. I'm not going to make a propaganda film. It scared them. Pardon me again. <coughs> so he made a great film, really great World War II film called They Were Expendable. The title alone, the title alone was not a happy thing for Hollywood. What do you mean they were expendable? You mean Americans were expendable? Hmm. me uh, because that's what the enemy did not what Americans did not true folks Americans did it too meaning they would go into a battle knowing certain amount of casualties will happen it was part of the equation so he, he wanted to do this a movie about early World War II with the invention uh, of the PT boat. It's a patrol boat that was maybe you've seen McHale's Navy. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a small boat with like 12, 14 guys on it. And they were, they were meant to go fast and furious. They had a lot of firepower on them. And they were lightweight. They are made out of uh, plywood, folks. And they would go in and out of Japanese warships and hammer the hell out of them. And they're so quick, they couldn't be hit very easily. They were hit, folks. Plenty of them died. Uh, and so he wanted to make a movie about those guys. Uh, starred Robert Montgomery. Uh, if you know Bewitched, <laughs> the series Bewitched, Samantha, Elizabeth Montgomery, that was her dad. He was a really wonderful actor, and he became a director also. 
and he's the star of this movie. John Wayne is the second lead. And then it has usual John Ford people in it, which use the same actors a lot, like Ward Bond and stuff. You don't need to know all this stuff. I know too much of this trivia. Anyway, the point is they lose. We got badly beaten in early World War II. The Japanese were outgunned us. They had more money. They had more men, better equipment. We were just ramping up the war effort. And so this is what this movie showed. It showed us losing. But we're going to make a comeback. So there is hope at the end. But we do lose in the movie. But there's that hopeful ending. And we all know when this movie came out in 1946, we know the ending. We turned it around. So we that's built into the audience's knowing the world we're living in. So that's what he directed. When William Wyler came back, he had this movie he wanted to do, which was perhaps one of the best movies of post-World War II, Veterans Returning Home, called The um, Best Years of Our Lives, about three veterans coming back to their hometowns and trying to take up life again. One of them was a wealthy banker. Uh, one of them was essentially a soda jerk. That's what they, we would call them baristas now in coffee shop. But a soda jerk was the guy who worked at the local Woolworths counter, you know, where they serve ice cream sodas and stuff when he went off the war. But he came back. He was a captain, a flyer. He looked really handsome in his uniform. He had married a woman who loved the uniform, loved the fact that he was a hero. Uh, and the other gentleman who was in it lost both of his hands during the war. The actor they hired for that had no hands. They were, he lost them in an accident, in a training accident during the war, but he didn't lose his hands from uh, actually enemy fire, but he did lose his hands in a training incident. And he had essentially very primitive artificial limbs, these are the three guys that came back and how they try to incorporate themselves into their lives again. And it's not easy. And it's not easy. The woman who loves the captain with the fancy, uh, who was the flyer, does not all of a sudden respect the guy who's a soda jerk, which is essentially a job for a teenager. That's hard to respect. And so they would go out dancing every Friday and she said, He's out of the army now, and she would beg him to wear the uniform. He goes, well, I'm not in the military anymore. She goes, please, you look so handsome in the uniform. She was embarrassed by who he'd become, who he really was. The war had changed him. The banker guy didn't run the bank, but he worked there, and he wanted to give loans to veterans who came back and lost their jobs, needed home loans, car loans, loans to start businesses, and the bank managers didn't like him giving money out to just any veteran. And he goes, well, these people sacrificed for four years. Can we please give something back? And so that's his dilemma. And the person with no arms came back to a family that loved him, a woman he was going to get married to, but now he has no arms. What's he going to do? How is he going to caress his children? And that's, those are hard. So it's a, it's a brilliant emotional movie on three veterans coming back and adjusting to civilian lives, civilian lives, the best years of our lives. Which was it? The title's got a two meaning. Is it the, is now the best years or was being in the war the best years? My father was in the war and he said to me many times, it might've been the best years of his life. He had a good time. He was only 21 years old. They were flying missions in Belgium and France. He spent a lot of times in bars, hanging out with women of ill repute. He had a pretty good time for a young man, and he didn't die. So to say it was the best years of his life sounds kind of grim, 
but there's reality to it. Uh, later on, uh, Frank Capra directed the wonderful It's a Wonderful Life. Maybe you've seen it. James Stewart, it's his first mo movie. James Stewart had joined the military, too. He was a colonel, a flyer. It was his first movie coming back out of the war. In the movie, if you've seen it, they show it every Christmas. It's a Christian uh, uh, favorite. Of, but when it first came out, it was it died at the box office. It's about a guy, George, who doesn't feel like he means anything to anybody, to his community, to his family. And he's going to make, commit suicide by jumping off the bridge. And an angel from heaven comes down and says, hold on now. Your life has meaning. And so he says, "I'm gonna, we're going to go look through the town and look at the meaning your life had on this town. And so he learns that even though he was just, wasn't a great man, great politician or millionaire, that he had worth. And the town needed him to thrive. He was part of the fabric of the community. And so he doesn't commit a suicide because he finds out he finds out the truth about his existence. These are heavy topics. When that movie came out, James Stewart said, well, my career's over. Nobody's going to want to see my movies anymore. That was not true. <laughs> but there were some years there where he thought it was true. So did Frank Capra. Um, George Stevens made the diary of Anne Frank, which was based on the Anne Frank diaries. If you know who Anne Frank was, she was the Jewish girl that was hiding with her family in the attic in a house in Amsterdam under Nazi occupation. This is real life, folks. And she's in that attic for three or four years, living in an attic, folks, with a half a dozen people eating. No showers, folks. They couldn't make a noise because if someone heard them, they'd report them. And the neighbors were out. They were supposed to report if there's any Jews in the area. Finally, one of Anne Frank's best friends squealed on her and turned her in. And she and her family were all sent to a concentration camp. And she died there, folks. But not before. But when she was in the attic, she wrote this very charming, heartbreaking, hopeful diary that things were going to get better when once the war's over. It didn't for her, folks. But a lot of the people who were in the attic with her who went to concentration camps did continue to live. They survived it. So that's the movie he made. These are considered frightful, kind of downer, realistic subjects, but they couldn't make the same movies they made before. They'd seen too much. John Huston made perhaps... His greatest movie, The Treasure of Sierra Madre, about guys seeking gold in the hills of Mexico and how it all goes wrong. But there's hope in it. So these five directors came back, and they contributed to the film community like never before. And they thrived until they died. Most of them died by the 70s. They'd been in the war. They'd been there, sacrificed their jobs, their career, came back and continued as artists. That's how important telling a story with a camera was to them. Is it still that important? Anyway, I'll post a preview of the, the movie. You'll see what I'm talking about. And you can watch it. I think it's on Netflix. It's a five parts they, I think each one's an hour. They take each director. It's really wonderful. Steve Spielberg produced it. Tom Hanks was the narrator. On that jolly note, I'll, get, I'll see you in a couple of days where the story of film will continue.